Hello, viewers, and welcome to yet another article review from Fantasy Flight Games. My name is Mitch, and I am the 10th Nazgul. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the fourth adventure pack of the Ringmaker cycle of adventure packs. This is the Neen in Elf, and this article starts off exactly where we left off. So in our most recent adventure, we were in Tharbad. We were in streets and alleys, fighting orcs, eluding assassins, and all the while trying to extricate information from a dwarf named Nalir. We were trying to save him from assassins and gather some sort of information in our continued endeavor to help Saruman and the rest of the White Council. In this adventure pack, we're continuing our journey through the swamplands, through the marshes of this Neen in Elf, if I'm pronouncing that at all correctly. We're looking for a hidden site, a concealed location within Holland that is rumored to be full of some sort of powerful secrets that's going to help us in our continued efforts against the Dark Lord Sauron. Unfortunately, however, we're not the only ones trying to make it to this secret location, as the minions of Sauron are out in force, and we're engaged in a desperate race against time to try to unveil, try to discover these secrets before the forces of Mordor have the opportunity to. But... As we're trying to trek as quickly as possible through these dangerous marshes, these fetid swamplands, we have to contend with a host of wicked, vile, and nasty creatures that inhabit the swamp, and we're going to be seeing that Time X keyword used against us again and again, as this article spoils multiple enemies that, at least from what we've seen so far, all have some sort of nasty synergistic effect where when time counters are removed, they end up triggering some sort of aversive or detrimental effect to the players. This article is pretty short, but it's very sweet. It doesn't go into a tremendous amount of detail, but it does reveal that we're going to be fighting a number of creature enemies amidst shifting bogs, and to represent our racing and kind of blindly stumbling or inaccurately navigating through these swamplands, we're going to be seeing a random sequence of quest stages. So similar to what we've seen in the past with something like Foundations of Stone, where there were one of four different options for quest phase four, here we're going to be presented with a series of quest stages that are probably going to be different each and every time you approach this scenario, so hopefully in that respect it'll have some huge built-in replayability, and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be seeing very heavy use of the new Time X keyword. This article does spoil several different card fans. We can see part of a quest phase, we can see part of a treachery, part of a location, but most interestingly in regard to encounter cards, we have spoiled for us three brand new enemies, the first of which is unique and is the Ancient Marsh Dweller. It has an engagement cost of 45, 3 threat, a massive 6 attack, 4 defense, and 9 hit points. It has the trait creature and cannot have attachments. The card is partially obscured, but it's almost certain to read that Ancient Marsh Dweller gets plus one threat and plus one attack for each resource token on it, and it has the forced effect after any number of time counters are removed from the current quest, place a resource token here. So this would suggest that many of these quest phases have built-in time mechanics, and this is just one example to illustrate that the longer we take to navigate through these swamplands, the more rounds we take to finish this scenario, 
the nastier it's going to get. So there's more threat in the staging area if we choose to let this enemy sit there unmolested, or it's hitting us harder. And of course, since it can't have attachments, we don't have the luxury of using Forest Snare to circumvent that ever-increasing threat value and attack value. And we can't even use Ranger Spikes to at least pin it in the staging area where even though its threat would increase over time, we wouldn't have to deal with some sort of nasty creature attacking us. So maybe we'll have to take advantage of more traditional effects like Rivendell Blade or Dwaro Delph Axe to try and kill this opponent. Certainly that very high engagement cost lends itself to effects like Unseen Strike, but it looks like there's not going to be any skirting around this big nasty enemy, so hopefully this isn't something we'll see unveiled at the beginning of a scenario, just because this seems like it would be a very nasty enemy to begin the game with sitting in play. Our second spoiled enemy is the Giant Swamp Adder, with a far lower engagement cost at 35, and a much more reasonable stat line at 3 threat, 3 attack, 3 defense, and 6 hit points. It's also a creature, but it also has that advantage against us players in that it cannot have attachments. And it has the forced effect, after any number of time counters are removed from the current quest, Giant Swamp Adder attacks the engaged player. So this is very nasty, it's still relatively hardy and difficult to destroy, and even though it isn't hitting nearly as hard as the Ancient Marsh Dweller, it's nevertheless going to be attacking frequently. So maybe it's going to be attacking during the combat phase, maybe it's going to be attacking at the end of the round when you remove a time counter, especially if we see some very nasty shadow effects, this could end up being a pretty dangerous enemy to leave sitting on the table. I think one of the most frustrating aspects of this card is that since time counters are removed at the very end of the refresh phase, even if you have some sort of action advantage attachment on that character, like a unique lore attachment spoiled in this article, you just might end up missing out on the opportunity to commit a character to the quest. For instance, if you have Steed of the Mark attached to one of your characters, if that character is already exhausted when it comes time to commit them to the quest or not, you're never going to have the opportunity to trigger that response. So, all in all, probably not the worst enemy in the adventure pack, but it certainly packs a nasty little punch, and last, and indeed perhaps, perhaps not least, we have the Neeker Breakers, which have engagement cost of 20, 2 threat, 1 attack, 1 defense, and still a pretty impressive 6 hit points. It has the traits Creature and also Insect, and as we've seen before, Forced. After any number of time counters are removed from the current quest, the engaged player, I assume, must deal 2 damage to an ally he controls, and Shadow, deal 1 damage to the defending, I assume, character. Of course, direct damage completely circumvents defense strength. This is probably an excellent opponent to see very early in the game, maybe even before you end up getting any allies in play, just because if there's any way to skirt around taking damage from that forced effect, I'd certainly suggest you do so. So this strikes me as an enemy where you probably want to do selective engagements just to ensure that this ends up engaged with a player that doesn't have any allies, or might have hardy allies, or perhaps since we're seeing a resurgence of the Eagles cards, and of course the development of the Sylvan synergy, Maybe you could also have it engaged with a player where you can rely on allies bouncing back to your hand, so that if they end up taking damage, so long as it doesn't kill them outright, 
you're essentially just shrugging off this effect. So uh, certainly a nasty enemy, the more copies you get into play, but I think so far probably the most innocent of this trio of new enemies. Of course, it's not just encounter cards that this article spoiled, as it also mentions that in this adventure pack we're going to be seeing a brand new ranger hero. They didn't actually provide any clues as to who that might be, and they also mention that the player cards introduced in this micro expansion are going to focus on new multiplayer interactions, as well as knowledgeable guidance and wise leadership. As with our enemies, we see a trio of player cards spoiled, the first of which is an example of what our developers mean with these novel player interactions. It's the one-cost leadership event, Follow Me, and it reads, quite simply, Action. Take control of the first player token and draw one card. While this effect may not seem like much, there are certainly specific scenarios where manipulating who the first player is can be extraordinarily useful. For instance, if you are playing Flight from Moria, you have to worry about the treachery a foe beyond, potentially killing a hero controlled by the last player. If you're fortunate enough to be in a better position where you have a hero with hit points sufficient to tank that treachery, you can play Follow Me as a little bit of a preventive or insurance type measure, just to try and make sure that that last player doesn't fall prey to the untimely death of a hero. And the same thing goes from enemies from the Kaza Doom expansion like Goblin Follower, where it engages with the last player. And certainly we've seen a number of different effects like the Haradrim Elite or the Treachery Leaping Flame, where it's either a treachery or an enemy entering play where they get bonus attacks against the first player. So if you don't have the luxury of a powerful sentinel defender sitting on the table, being able to have a little bit more say in regard to what encounter effects influence one player could potentially be a pretty good thing. We've seen some very nasty enemies lately, like in the nightmare version of The Hills of Emin Wheel. We saw the tunneling nameless thing. And if you can control what enemy that engages with, not only are you more likely to be able to end up killing it, but you're probably a lot less likely to lose characters to some sort of massive, heinous enemy attack with all sorts of different shadow effect possibilities. Throughout the game, we've seen countless effects that target the first player, the last player, so Follow Me is interesting, I think really the downfall to this card is that it's extraordinarily situational. Unless you're scrying, you can't really guarantee that it's going to help you. And certainly in a multiplayer game, the effectiveness of scrying drops off considerably. The chance that this could whiff certainly sucks. I suppose there is some redeeming value in that at the very least you are drawing one card for one resource so it is replacing itself in your hand but all in all I'm just not sure I'm in a huge rush to include this in my deck. Uh, certainly we'll have to see if this scenario itself introduces some unique mechanic where it's of the utmost importance that you control who has that first player token. And of course, if you're taking advantage of effects like the Tome of Atanator, potentially one player might be able to lock down the first player token for the majority of the game. Uh, leadership doesn't have a tremendous amount of card draw. Certainly there are effects like Campfire Tales and Valiant Sacrifice at a leadership player's disposal, so we'll certainly have to see what comes of Follow Me 
at the moment, it's a card to watch. I don't see myself auto-including it in any decks by any means, but I certainly think it's far from worthless. It's very unique, and I'm curious to see what happens to it. This article also spoils a spirit event, the Zero Cost Island Amid Perils, which builds on our burgeoning Sylvan Synergy. So for no cost, it reads, Action! Return a Sylvan ally you control to your hand to reduce your threat by X, where X is the printed cost of the ally returned to your hand. And this is probably the most interesting card that we've seen in this expansion. The Sylvan Synergy, as it's beginning to establish itself throughout the Ringmaker cycle, is built around this when enters, when exits play type of effect. Spirit certainly has a number of different cards to reduce threats, ranging from the Galadrim's Greeting to Elrond's Council, but since we're seeing a resurgence of secrecy cards, it certainly doesn't hurt to have additional means of decreasing your threats, and maybe this card is sufficiently powerful that it allows you to save some of your other threat reduction effects for other players. Seeing as how if you're running Sylvan characters, you're deriving benefit from each and every time they leave or interplay, this feeds into that synergy perfectly, and given that itself costs zero, it's hopefully going to leave you with sufficient or adequate resources where you can dump those allies back into play. Since they return to your hand, they aren't shuffled into your deck, as we've seen with other similar Sylvan Synergy cards. What is a little bit of a shame about this card is that at the present moment, seeing as how we've only had the Voice of Isengard expansion released, there's not actually any Sylvan character that gives us any sort of benefit from its leaving play. So unless you've got some sort of effect like Prince Imrahil, Horn of Gondor, Valiant Sacrifice, all those traditional, well-established leaving play effects, you're not really deriving any additional benefits. Uh, even out of all the elves, we've only seen Rivendell Minstrel, where it has a win enters play benefit. But of course, since that's a Noldor trait ally, that's entirely ineligible to be targeted by this card. Given our current card pool, one potentially clever use for this event would be in conjunction with Children of the Sea, an event from the Blood of Gondor adventure pack where you could give a Sylvan character plus two willpower until the end of phase, and then once you've completed that quest resolution step, prior to the very end of the quest phase, when that character would be shuffled back into your deck you could simply trigger this action and bounce it back to your hand instead. So not only would you have it to play again during your next planning phase, but you'd also pick up that threat reduction benefit as well. And in a number of different spoiler articles, we've seen a multitude of different Sylvan allies and heroes that do start to establish that enter and exit play mechanic. Probably the foremost of which is Celeborn, a new hero where as Sylvan characters interplay, their stats are bolstered. We've also seen the Nath Guide, with a cost of two, which would reduce your threat by two, and when it enters play, you pick a hero, and that turn they don't exhaust to quest. And then probably the the most powerful, if you happen to be running some sort of spirit tactics type deck, which at least in the progression series has worked out very well for Matthew and I, we have Rumil with a cost of four, so you not only see some pretty significant threat reduction, but when he enters play, so long as
long as you've got a lot of ranged characters on the table, so long as you have enemies engaged with either you or someone else, you can deal some pretty significant direct damage, again, entirely circumventing their defense value. So... This is certainly a powerful card. It's only going to get more and more powerful as we see more and more Sylvan Synergy. So this is yet another card to keep your eye on. And since we've only got a handful of spoilers to go off of, by the time we crack open our fourth adventure pack, there's hopefully a multitude of other powerful effects we'll have readily available at our disposal with which to take advantage of to just kick this card into overdrive and just make this absolutely fantastic. Our final player card spoiled in this article is the unique lore attachment, Wingfoot. The article points out that this is yet another Aragorn-themed attachment, and even though this card doesn't explicitly mention him by name, Wingfoot is what Aomer took to calling Aragorn. This card, for a cost of one, has the trait title, and reads, Attached to a Ranger Hero. Response. After attached hero commits to a quest, name enemy, location, or treachery. If a card of the named type is revealed during this quest phase, ready attached hero. So, first and foremost, this is an extraordinarily affordable action advantage attachment within the lore sphere. And that's definitely something where we haven't seen many cards like this in that particular sphere of influence. So certainly way back in the day when the Dead Marshes came out, we saw Fast Hitch, which was Hobbit only. This is fairly restrictive in that it's only attachable to Ranger heroes, at the present moment, we only have access to six different Ranger heroes. But this article does mention that we're going to be receiving a new Ranger hero in this very adventure pack. And in the three trials, the second adventure pack scheduled to come out for the Ringmaker cycle, we're going to be receiving a Dunedain hero. And at least at the moment... Every single Dunedain hero we've seen released so far also has the Ranger trait, so by the time that we open this adventure pack, we'll potentially have a pool of eight eligible characters to draw from. Unfortunately, only two of those have an in-sphere lore match to this card, but it's nevertheless very affordable and potentially very powerful. I think it goes without saying that this scales extraordinarily well in a multiplayer game, but it's also exceptionally useful in a single-player game. So, if you're running a game with a lot of players, not only are you very likely to hit, whether you blindly guess enemy, location, or treachery, even without taking advantage of any sort of scrying effects... In a single-player game, you can kind of hedge your bet based on what you would want to use that action for. For instance, if you're playing a scenario, you don't have any enemies on the table, you're concerned about a big, nasty enemy coming off the top of the encounter deck, simply guess enemy. Maybe if you'd reveal a treachery or location, you wouldn't end up needing to use that action anyway. So, even though this attachment isn't always going to hit... I definitely think it's pretty powerful, and every ranger we've seen has at least two points of willpower, so at the very least, being able to send them as an additional character to the quest can end up having some pretty monumental benefits. And if you're running a scenario that might end up Having something like the battle keyword, maybe if you're running Faramir, you can see a much more considerable benefit than a measly two points added to your questing total. Really, the only outright shame of this card is that it does become a little bit redundant if you were intending to play it on a ranger like the leadership version of Aragorn that we saw in the core set, 
But if you're not running a card like Steed of the Mark or ideally Unexpected Courage, maybe because you don't have access to the Spirit Sphere, this certainly provides a nice alternative. As I alluded to earlier, you're certainly welcome to take advantage of any number of different scrying effects to try and get the absolute most out of this card, whether you prefer to run Denethor as a hero, Hinamarth Riversong from the core set, or Rumor from the Earth, or perhaps you're even giving Secrecy a chance in which case Needful to Know would be the absolute perfect event to include in your deck. So it would not only serve to scry for you, but it would also have the built-in benefit of potentially helping you to maintain that secrecy threshold. If you're trying to run a ranger deck or a trap deck, maybe you're taking advantage of ranger bow, so having additional actions to draw from in order to trigger that attachment certainly never hurts, and depending on what enemy comes off the top of the encounter deck, or depending on what's already in play, maybe it ends up being the perfect opportunity for you to snipe some adversary before you have to deal with it in a traditional sense. All in all, I think that especially considering the monumentally high threat cost of each and every one of our existing ranger heroes, being able to get as much as you possibly can out of their usually pretty generous statistical allotments is just of the utmost importance. So, all in all, I think this is a fantastic card. I always encourage players to do a statistical breakdown of the encounter deck, so if it's something like Return to Mirkwood that you're playing against, where the encounter deck has extraordinarily high location density, as I mentioned before, be sure to hedge your bet and go with what's most likely. If you're only up against an encounter deck that has 25% enemies, maybe consistently picking enemy each and every quest phase isn't really going to get you as much benefit as picking something that's a little bit more certain. So I'm excited to include this card. I think that it's fantastic that we're seeing the development of traits like Ranger, like Sylvan. As the developers mentioned in our last article, we're even starting to see things done with Warrior, with Healer, with Noble, all sorts of different things like that. So I think the Lord of the Rings, the card game, is moving in a very interesting direction. As always, I'm very excited to see what comes out next. I mentioned earlier this was a very short, albeit very sweet, article, very spoiler-laden. I'm excited for this article. I like the art on all the creatures. I like their abilities. I think the time keyword itself is pretty fascinating, and I love the possibilities of having a very highly replayable scenario. Hopefully this ends out working a little bit better than the steward's fear did, just because... I feel like this isn't going to drag out nearly as much. When you've got added incentive to make sure that you're trying to tear through the encounter deck and those quest cards as quickly as possible, just so you don't have to deal with all the time counters coming off, this could potentially be a hell of a lot of fun. It might scale very well in a multiplayer environment, if we see locations or treacheries or maybe even enemies that speed up the rate at which those time counters are removed. So in a four-player game, maybe you're having to deal with multiple additional attacks from certain enemies each round. Or maybe you have a forced effect dealing direct damage to your allies several different times throughout the quest phase, so this scenario certainly has the potential to be very nasty, but at the same time, I'm very excited for it. I very much enjoyed the Dead Marshes type setting, and I'm looking forward to getting back into the fetid, nasty, disgusting swampland, so... As always, be sure to let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are about all these different player cards that we had spoiled, our upcoming enemies, the setting in which this adventure pack and this quest are going to be taking place, 
And maybe most of all, let me know who you think this new hero is going to be. There weren't any clues dropped. All we know is that it's going to have the ranger trait. So... If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already, and if you want news about this channel, if you want to hear about upcoming videos and upcoming projects first and foremost, be sure to check out facebook.com slash 10th Nazgul Show. So, thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon.